It is known all too well that Jesus was born of a virgin, and it's celebrated every year during Christmas time. With beautiful nativity scenes and Christmas trees glowing around with lights and presents, showing love for fellow humanity and your loved ones. But it's not as well known of how common these ideas were in the ancient world. And in this episode, I want to highlight not only a common idea of a hero being born, but a common idea that was written before, during and after the time of the New Testament. When you're done paying attention, I hope if you're a believer in Jesus, you at least are honest in asking yourself this question. Is it also true of these other figures? Is it also true of Caesar Augustus? Why do I pick this one over those? And if it is this common, is it true that Jesus really was born this way? Or is this how they wrote legends and created gods? What child is this? Miraculous births and divine parents in the time of Jesus. Check out the article in the description. It's published December 23rd, 2016. Many people are familiar with the stories in the New Testament Gospels of Luke and Matthew about Jesus' conception and birth. But what is less well known is how common such stories are when the lives of great men are told. From the initial announcement of an impending conception to Mary and Luke, Joseph and Matthew, to the signs and portents signaling the birth of the miraculous child. Ancient Greek and Roman writings share a lot with the Gospel accounts. The Gospels claim that Jesus' birth was foretold in advance. Matthew quotes from the prophet Isaiah to establish Jesus' birth as a divine promise that would usher in a time of peace and justice. Virgil, writing in the early first century AD, wrote about a promised child the offspring of the gods, who would bring a golden age of peace and prosperity to the Roman Empire. In other words, the emperor. He is the one who declared the Pax Ramata, where peace for centuries in Rome endured by his creation. Augustus Caesar's birth was foretold by portents, according to the Roman historian Suetonius. Unusual astronomical occurrences were understood as divine omens in Roman culture. So it is no wonder that Jesus' birth, like Augustus's, was depicted as important using a miraculous star. I want to make an interesting note. These stars in the Greco-Roman world, it wasn't uncommon for a figure, a hero, that gets deified, what we call an apotheosis, would go off into the celestial fear with the divine. Whether it was a monotheistic or a polytheistic world, the celestial heavens is where they would go. So much so that this is exactly what Augustus did with the death of Julius Caesar. He's the first emperor of Rome but also the first one to make the worship and apotheosis of other figures other than Romulus the case in the Roman Empire, where the Caesars began to be deified after their death. All of the Caesars from Julius Caesar onward. Before that, when the Republic was on, it was Romulus. Of course, his brother Remus played a significant role in the origins of Rome. But Augustus also has a new declaration of an origin story for Rome itself, because he brought things that no one else has. He brought peace like no one else has. Let's also note that Alexander the Great's birth also had meteorological omens surrounding it. Plutarch tells us that both Philip and Olympias, Alexander's parents, were sent dreams from the gods announcing Alexander's birth. Olympias dreamed that her womb was struck by lightning, while Philip dreamed that he put a seal on his wife's womb in the image of a lion. Most significant, though, 
is the report that Philip spied a divine serpent sleeping next to his wife, which he took as a sign that he should avoid sleeping with her himself, since it was clear that she was to conceive from a divine rather than human source. These tropes were so common in the Greco-Roman world that the gospel authors are utilizing this same theme. Why do we think this one's true and not that one? Can't we see the clever, ingenious development of mythology beneath our own eyes? Just as Matthew records Herod's attempt to stop the prophesied child by killing all newborn babies, Suetonius tells a similar account of Roman leaders attempting to prevent Augustus's rise to power by ordering that no male child be reared. In Matthew, Jesus and his family escape the massacre of the infants by fleeing to Egypt, whereas in Suetonius, like in the Moses story, fathers and mothers to be thwart the murderous plans. In the Roman case, by preventing the decree from being officially registered with the treasury, the theme of trying to prevent this divine child from coming and prophesied to rule and be a ruler of the people, they're trying to thwart it. And of course, they are not able to do so. And although Matthew and Luke trace Jesus's lineage through his non-biological father, Joseph, Jesus is depicted as God's own offspring. Augustus Caesar was also adopted by his father Julius Caesar and likewise considered himself the descendant of a god, Venus Genetrix. Augustus traced his lineage to Venus through his ancestor Romulus, the legendary founder of Rome. Romulus and his twin brother Remus were conceived by the virgin priestess after the god Mars impregnated her. This priestess, as Virgil reports, was herself descendant from Venus through her ancestor Aeneas, Venus's beloved son. Alexander the Great's divine parentage was reinforced. He grew up just as the adult Jesus was publicly claimed by God as his son in all four gospel accounts, Alexander's father, Zeus Amon, confirmed his son's divine identity. Plutarch tells us that when Alexander approached an Egyptian oracle to ask whether he had avenged his father's murder, the priest made him rephrase his request. Since his father was not a mortal man, and addressed Alexander in oracular speech as O son of Zeus. One of the most common places to find stories of miraculous births in the life of heroes, often born of a union between a god and a human being, Hercules, perhaps the most famous of the Greek heroes, is the son of Zeus and the mortal woman, Aclamene. For example, Zeus disguised himself as Aclamene's husband in order to trick her into bed with him. The divine parentage that Hercules enjoyed enabled him to do many wondrous feats. Likewise, Asclepius, son of Apollo, rescued from the womb of Corinus, was gifted with miraculous healing abilities and was later considered divine in his own right. Since Matthew and Luke don't agree with each other about what happened when Jesus was born, it's especially interesting that they both relate something miraculous in their narratives. The idea of Jesus' own miraculous birth may have supported the gospel claims about Jesus' miraculous working ability, including healings and other wondrous feats. It is an interesting note that all of the Caesars, for the most part, after Augustus Caesar had apotheosis. They would ascend on high, usually by the wings of eagles, and the name Octavian was given Augustus, which is the majestic, the increaser, 
or the Venerable, and many of its descended forms, August, Augusto, Austin, Augustine, as well as the title into the Greek translation, Sebastos or Sebastian. Let me read from Suetonius, Lives of the Caesars, a new translation by Catherine Edwards, Oxford World's Classics. And now that we are on the subject, it would not be irrelevant to add an account of the events before his birth, on the very day he was born and subsequently from which could be drawn the hope and expectation of his greatness and enduring good fortune. When in ancient times part of the wall of Velletri had been touched by lightning, this was seen as a sign that a citizen of the town would one day be ruler. Bolstered by this, the people of Velletri immediately waged war with Roman people, and on many subsequent occasions too, almost to their own destruction. Finally, however, it became clear that this event had been a sign portending the power of Augustus. Julius Marathus records that a few months before Augustus was born, a prodigy was generally observed at Rome which announced that nature was bringing forth a king for the Roman people. The Senate, he continues, was most alarmed and agreed that no child born in that year should be raised. Doesn't this sound like Matthew? However, those whose wives were pregnant ensured that the decree was not registered in the treasury, since each hoped that the prodigy referred to his own child. I read in the books of Asclepiades of Mendes, entitled Theologia that Atia, attending the sacred rites of Apollo in the middle of the night, had her litter poisoned in the temple and fell asleep while the other matrons were also sleeping. All of a sudden, a serpent slid up to her, then quickly went away. On waking, she purified herself as she would after sleeping with her husband, and at once there appeared on her body a mark in the image of a snake, and she was never able to get rid of it so that ever afterwards she avoided going to the public baths. Augustus was born ten months later, and for this reason is believed to be the son of Apollo. It was Atia too, who before she gave birth dreamed that her insides were carried to the stars and spread over all the earth and the skies. Octavius the father dreamed that the sun rose from Atia's womb. On the day Augustus was born, when the conspiracy of Catiline was being discussed in the Senate house and Octavius stayed away until late because his wife was in labor, Pubulus, hearing why he was delayed when informed of the hour of the birth, asserted, as is generally known, that the master of the world was born. When Octavius, who was leading an army through remote regions of Thrace, sought guidance concerning his son at some barbarian rituals in the grove of Father Liber. The same prediction was made by the priest, for so great a flame had leapt up when they poured wine on the altar that it passed beyond the peak of the temple roof and right up to the sky, a portent which had only previously occurred when Alexander the Great offered sacrifice at the altar. And on the very next night, Thereafter, he dreamed he saw his son of greater than mortal size with a thunderbolt and a sepulcher and emblems of Jupiter best and greatest and a radiant crown on a chariot decorated with laurel drawn by 12 horses of astonishing whiteness. When Augustus was still a baby, as is recorded in the writings of Gaius Dr Drusus, he was placed one evening by his nurse in his cot on level ground, but the next morning he had disappeared. He was only found after a long search in a tower of great height where he lay facing the rising sun. When he first began to speak, he ordered some frogs to be silent who happened to be croaking in his grandfather's villa, and they say that from that time no frog croaked there. When he was having a snack in a grove by the fourth milestone along the road to Campania, suddenly an eagle snatched the bread from his hand, and after flying up high into the sky, unexpectedly came back and dropping down gently returned it to him. After the dedication of the Capitoline temple, Quintus Catullus had dreams for two nights in succession 
First, the Jupiter best and greatest, when a number of youths were playing around his altar, took one of them aside and placed in the fold of the toga the image of the Republic, which he carried in his hand. And on the next night that he noticed the same boy in the lap of Capitoline Jupiter, when he was gave orders that the boy be brought down, this was forbidden by a warning from the god. As the boy was being reared for the salvation of the state, and on the next day, Catullus encountered Augustus, who was otherwise unknown to him, and looking upon him with wonder, remarked on his great similarity to the boy in his dream. Others give a different account of Catullus' first dream, namely that when a number of well-born youths asked Jupiter for a guardian, he pointed out one of their number on whom they were to depend for all their wishes, and having touched the boy's mouth, with his fingers, then brought them to his own lips. Marker Cicero, when following Julius Caesar up to the capital, happened to tell his friends of his own dream of the previous night. A boy of noble appearance was let down from the sky on a golden chain. He came to rest before the doors of the Capitoline Temple and was presented with a whip by Jupiter. Immediately afterwards, Cicero saw Augustus who was then relatively unknown and had been summoned to the ceremony by his great uncle Caesar and declared that he was the one whose image had appeared to him in his dream. The story in the 12 Caesars or the life of the Caesars, Suetonius, you really should read. There are endless accounts of Greco-Roman heroes and figures, well-known men who are deified with birth narratives, life narratives, miraculous feats, whether they're heroes from Asclepius, Heraclius, and other divine gods, and men, demigods, who became divine at their death, sometimes even having an apotheosis in their life to their death. So I recommend anyone who's really serious about investigating how this literature works and is fascinated with it as much as I am here at Myth Vision and my friend is Nil at Gnostic Informant, keep investigating, read this ancient literature, and you'll find how common this really was. So when you read the Gospels, that force field of protecting them from the outside world really dissipates, and you can actually take a critical approach recognizing how common the miraculous claims, the birth narratives, the ascension narratives, and all such claims for Jesus aren't really that rare. They're well known in the ancient world, even if they aren't Xerox copies of each other. If you enjoyed this content, please consider joining MythVision's Patreon, joining MythVision's YouTube membership program, you can give us a generous thanks through the thanks button there or a one-time donation to help us continue doing what we're doing and educating the general public and making these edits available to a broader audience. Thank you so much for the support. Share this with somebody who favors Jesus over these other figures and have them do an investigation on their own to see if they draw similar conclusions. Thank you. And never forget, we are MythVision.